Hello everyone. In this video, we will be talking about two things, uh, the area function and then the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, which has to do with the area function. So what is this area function? So here our context is f of x is just some function and a is in the domain of f. And so we define the area function to be this a sub f, so a for area and the subscript f because it is specific to this function f of x is going to be the integral from a to x of f of, d, f of t dt. So there are a few things to talk about here. Um, so suppose this is our picture of f and we've got our little border at a here. So why this is called the area function, right, is we have this definite integral that is signed area and the input is x here, right? So we're basically inputting the right bound or upper bound for our integral. So if I have this x, for instance, then my a f of x is going to be this area, right? And so if I then plug in, say, y here, then I would get that red area plus this blue area. And so a f of y there would be same basic thing, right? Except it would be the integral from a to y instead of from a to x. And so the other thing you may look at and find confusing is why do we have t instead of x on the inside? Why is it f of t, not f of x? And the reason is our x is the variable for the area function, right? It's changing this endpoint, changing the upper bound of integration. It's not changing our f function originally. And so we don't want to have the x variable representing two different things. And so that's why we want t on the inside so as not to have a double meaning for x. So let's start with a simple example. So here we'll just have a constant function, right? So uh, I've got f of x equals k, where k is some constant. Just draw it up here. And then I am going to look specifically at this area function. I'm going to call it big F. We'll see why I may be doing that in a second. And we'll just do the area from 0 to x of f of t dt. Right, so we have an, a different area function for any a. And so in this case, I'm just choosing 0 as my a or my starting point. Uh, but, you know, we can have different things uh, if we start at 1, for instance. And we'll look at that here after this example. Um, so... What do I get here? So I'm starting at 0, and then I'm going to some x, right? And so f of x is this area in here. Well, my height is, this is just a rectangle, right? So my height is k, my width is x, and so this area is just going to be kx. Okay? Uh, if you wanted to look at this for specific values then, right? So We'll look at this in a couple of different ways. So f of 1 then, big F of 1, is just k times 1, right? It's just going to be k. Big F of 2 would be 2k, and so on. How do we really interpret this? Well, if we look in blue, right? So let's say if we stop at 1 here. So big F of 1 is also the definite integral from 0 to 1 of, well, in this case, k dt. And so it would just be this blue sliver of width 1 and height k, and so that's another way to see that we should get area k. But the point is, if you find a general formula by looking at the area, noticing this is a rectangle, then you can just treat this as any other function uh, and just plug in your values for x. Um, and something that we'll see later is always going to be the case is, do we notice a connection between big F and little f? So big F is kx and little f is k. So we can see that big F is an antiderivative of little f. And it turns out this area function will always be an antiderivative of the function you're taking the area under. So I want to talk about two other things that might concern you here. So notice that I only looked to the right to make sense of that, right? I, I said my x was positive there and then I made this rectangle. What if I hadn't done that, right? What if I had chosen uh, an x to the left of the x-axis, right? So what if my x is over here? So then I'm looking at the zero, right? Big F of x is integral from zero to x of k dt. Uh, and we know from properties of integrals, right? So I am looking at this area here in black, but I'm kind of traveling in the wrong direction, right? Zero to x is going backwards in time. 
And remember, if we flip our bounds, we go forward in time, we would flip the sign. So this is negative x to zero of k dt. And then you can view this area the normal way, right? Because we're going from left to right. And so what would this area be? Well, you'd get negative uh, from the minus sign outside. My height is k. And then from left, uh, right minus left to get that length is 0 minus x. And so you get negative k times negative x. You would still get kx. So we're good. Um, now, what about some other options? So what if we didn't start at 0 here? What if I take the area function starting at 1 instead? How does this change things? So in this case, right, I'm taking here at 1. And then, you know, maybe I go to some other x down here. I'll just kind of erase that for now. Uh, then what happens? So my area is no longer kx, right? Because my width has changed. So I have height k and I have width x minus 1 now. And so my, my area function in this case is kx minus k. But what do we notice about that antiderivative business again, right? Well, since k is a constant, g prime of x is still going to be k. So this is also an antiderivative, just a different one than big F. Okay, so let's look at one more example before we move on. And let's look at one that is still a line, uh, but will level up a little bit and make it not a horizontal line. So again, you should start by drawing a picture just to get an idea of what's going on here, right? So this is a line of slope 2. And so if I go, right, so let's, let's again look at the integral from 0 to x of, in this case, this would be 2t dt, right? That would be f of, or whoops, I wrote f of t, this is f of x. Um, then if I go over to x and talk about this area here from 0 to x, well, my height is going to be 2x, right? And I have a triangle, so I know how to do this area. This is 1 half base times height, so it's 1 half times x times 2x. And so I'm going to get x squared. And again, I would like to point out, what is the derivative of big F? Well, it is 2x, and so it is exactly little f. So again, I am getting an antiderivative here. And if you wanted to like quickly figure out what this area would be down here, say, you know, at negative 2, this blue area... Uh, this would be f of negative 2, big F of negative 2. And instead of having to calculate area of a triangle, I could just plug it into this x squared formula, right? And get negative 2 squared, which is going to be 4. So for your first exercise, uh, look at the uh, graph below. So I'm not giving you a specific equation. And by the way, this is just in case like it's not clear from the drawing. This is indeed a semicircle. The rest are indeed straight lines. Uh, and so I have defined the two area functions I want you to look at. So big F is from 0 to x, big G is from 1 to x. And so I want you to compute these four values for these functions. And I would like to note this last one here, right? We're going to negative 1, so you should be thinking carefully about which direction you are going. All right, so now we're ready to move on to the fundamental theorem of calculus. So... This is obviously a pretty important theorem. You can probably tell by the name. Uh, we will usually abbreviate this as FTC, and it has two parts. Uh, we'll talk about part two next time. So part one is about the area function. So in this case, uh, if F is continuous on an interval I containing the point A, or the value A, then our area function, right, just defined as it was before, uh, it gives you an actual value no matter what your x is in that interval and as we have seen so far the derivative of your area function is the function you started with so the area function is an antiderivative of little f so the first thing we're going to do is see why this is true well so we're taking a derivative and we don't have just a general formula right because we don't know what f is so we're actually going to go back to that limit definition of the derivative here Okay, so we've got the area function, we're plugging in x plus h, we're plugging in x all over h here as h goes to zero. Now, I know what the area function is in terms of just its general form, right? This is the integral from a to x plus h of f of t dt minus the integral from a to x of f of t dt 
all over h. Now here is where it is very important to draw a picture so you can really see what is going on. So let's say this is our f here, and then this is our a. So if we're going to x, right, then we're talking about this area in the red, right? That's this guy over here. And then in blue is saying, okay, we, we tack on this h, we go to x plus h instead, and we're adding on this sliver of area to the red, right? So this is uh, blue plus the red, right? We get both of those areas there. So when I subtract the red from the red and blue, what am I left with? Well, I'm left with only this blue sliver, right? So I'm basically just looking at this. Uh, you know, this here is up at f of x, and my width down here is h, right? It's x plus h minus x. So what have I done? Well, I can simplify this numerator quite a bit now, right? I'm really looking at just the area between x and x plus h. So I'm looking at the definite integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt all over h. But my point is you can actually kind of figure out what this area is, right? This is just this sliver. Now, it's not exactly a rectangle, right? There's definitely some, some dip here. Um, but the point is, as h goes to zero, right, as I take this rectangle to be thinner and thinner, uh, my value of f, because it's continuous, right, is approaching f of x. And so you want to think of the height as being roughly f of x here for your rectangle. And your width is definitely h. And so I can rewrite this now. That integral is area. And my area is about f of x times h over h. Well, now I can cancel h's. And since f of x doesn't depend on h, I actually get f of x. And so this is exactly what I wanted to show, right? The derivative of my area function is the function I started with. So we're going to look at a few examples here and then finish up. So I just have the, the fundamental theorem up at the top here, just as a, a reference. So in this case, now this looks like a nasty integral that we don't know how to deal with or find the area of and like how do we find the derivative well this theorem makes it really easy right so notice right a to x well i again have a x and it says i should just turn the inside f of t into f of x and so this derivative is actually really quick we just plug in x for t so e to the four sine x plus the square root of tangent of x plus two and so this theorem is super powerful. We don't have to do a lot of work. We just get this from the theorem for free, okay? Now let's look at a little bit harder one. So what if I have the derivative from a to x squared instead of x? So this doesn't let the theorem immediately apply, right? Like I, I want an x up there, not an x squared. So what happens here? Well, again, x was our input, right? It's our variable. So instead of our input being x, our input changes to x squared. So the way I like to think of this is my original area function is like a to x of sine of t dt. And then what I've changed this to is say, you know, g of x, which is the integral from a to x squared of sine of t dt. So what's the difference? Well, g of x is just a of x squared, right? And now this should look a lot like a chain rule problem to you, right? We have an inside function. I've got an x squared as my input instead of my x. So if I want g prime, I'm just gonna do the chain rule. It's gonna be a prime, plug in x squared, right? Take the derivative of the outside, plug in the inside, times the derivative of the inside, which is going to be two x here. So then our only question is, what is a prime? Well. For a of x, this is a direct application of the fundamental theorem, right? So FTC part one tells us immediately that a prime is I just plug in x for t and I get sine of x. So if a prime of x is sine of x, then a prime of x squared is sine of x squared times two x, and this would be our answer. So let's do one final example just to make sure that chain rule makes sense here. So here again, I'm not seeing x up here, right? I'm seeing sine of x. So that should be a hint that FTC doesn't directly apply, but I wanna be doing the chain rule. 
So again, I'll look back to like a of x. What, what's the function and its derivative when I just have x there, right? What, what would happen in the easy world where I don't have sine of x but just x? So if I do that, then a prime by the fundamental theorem again is just square root of x, right? And so when I look at g of x, well, what's its relation to a? Well, it's exactly a, except for instead of plugging in x, I'm plugging in sine of x on the inside, right? And so then I do the chain rule, and my g prime is a prime of sine x times derivative of sine, which is cosine. And a prime of x is root x, so a prime of sine x is the square root of sine x. And this would be our final answer. All right, and for your second exercise to, to end things here, you're going to let capital G be the integral from 1 to e to the x of tangent of 2t dt. And I want you to find its derivative using the FTC part 1. And here, right, because you have an e to the x there, you should be thinking chain rule. Okay, thank you for watching.